From the beginning, man's understanding of the nature of the external universe relied on visible light. That particular band of electromagnetic radiation to which the human eyes adapted to respond. This was so until about 30 years ago when scientific men started to develop new eyes. Instruments able to respond to the invisible spectrum of electromagnetic radiation on either side of visible light on the wavelength scale. Of all these instruments, the radio telescope is the most important. In less than 20 years, it has brought us to a new turning point in scientific history. For it has looked out to the furthest reaches of the universe and it has revealed phenomena of such violence that their explanation may require modification of the laws of physics. The Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge, assisted by grants from the Science Research Council, was one of the first in the field of radio astronomy, and in the Mullard Radio Astronomy Observatory, just outside Cambridge, has one of the world's most important centres of scientific research in this field. Its work has been directed since 1946, by Professor Sir Martin Ryle. Our understanding of the physics of radio sources depends on our ability to observe them properly. And this means that much of the radio astronomer's life is concerned with the design and construction of bigger and better radio telescopes. There are two main problems here. The first is concerned with the fact that the radio signals are extremely weak. And what we want to do is to construct a large dish so that we collect as much of the incoming signals as we can and then connect this to a very sensitive radio receiver. The second problem is concerned with the very small angular size of the sources. Most of them are less than a few minutes of arc and some are even less than one second of arc in extent. Many of them consist of a number of small components. Now our, our ability to examine the structure of these sources depends on the ratio between the diameter of the dish, D, and the wavelength at which we are operating. The quantity D over lambda then determines the structure which we can see in our source and, for example, the ability to see whether a, a given source is double. We might, for example, make observations with this instrument and find that a source had the appearance of two components some small distance apart. If now we had made observations at a longer wavelength or at the same wavelength with a smaller diameter instrument, each of these images would have been blurred out into a larger image and we would find that we'd lost all this detailed information and would not even be able to say whether or not the source had two components in it. The shortest wavelength at which we can use our dish depends on the accuracy with which the surface is a true paraboloid. And in practice, there will be deflections caused by the weight of the structure and the forces of the wind, which will cause errors in our surface. And if these errors are more than about one twentieth of the operating wavelength, our dish will not make a proper image. And this is, has turned out to be an extremely difficult problem, as can be seen from this diagram here. This represents the diameter of the dish along here, and up here we have the ratio between the diameter of the dish and the surface accuracy. So this scale gives us a measure of the best resolution we can get with a given instrument. This is also shown on the scale here, represented in minutes of arc. Now, the resolution of the human eye is about one minute of arc here, and so we see that for this small dish, which is in fact a five metre diameter dish at the University of Texas, we are getting a resolution about the same as that of the human eye. But unfortunately for such a small instrument, the collecting power is so small that many of the most important problems uh, cannot be tackled. And as we go to larger instruments which have more collecting power, we see that the resolution gets progressively worse. This point here, for example, is the good 45 metre dish at Greenbank. And about here, there will be the 100 metre dish now being built at Bonn. But you see that even with these latest modern instruments, we still see that the resolution we can achieve gets worse and worse as we go to larger sized instruments. Now, if we are to understand the physics of the sources, we must be able to make detailed maps of them. But it seems that we cannot do so by constructing larger dishes. 
We must, therefore, find some other way of building large radio telescopes. But a remarkably effective and economic solution has been developed by Professor Ryle at Cambridge. It is known as aerial synthesis and relies upon the high speed of calculation available with computers, like those at the Cavendish. As Professor Ryle has just said, radio astronomers want very large telescopes able to operate at very short wavelengths. Such a telescope would need to be several kilometers in diameter to see a radio source in detail and to collect enough energy from it to operate even a sensitive receiver. The problem of building such a structure is immense. It is complicated still further when the dish has to be steered to look at a source in a different part of the sky. On the other hand, radio astronomers and engineers already have experience in building and operating small aerials of about 20 meters in diameter. The Cambridge solution of the problems of resolution, seeing the fine details and sensitivity, obtaining energy, employs two or more small dishes connected to one receiver and electronic store. The area covered by the small aerials is made to equal or synthesize the area of the very large telescope. To understand the system, let us first of all consider resolution. These small aerials receive signals from a wider area of the sky and from many different radio sources at the same time. We can see that the signal from one source is received first by one dish and then by the other after a delay. We can see that the length of the delay depends on the direction the signal comes from. So altogether we have a jumble of signals. Adding a known period of time to the delays helps to identify particular signals. Changing the separation of the aerials gives a changing pattern of delays. Those for very oblique signals change most. Those from vertical signals least. The record is made up of all the signals and their different time delays. From this information, with the aid of a computer, an increasingly detailed map of the sky is built up. At Cambridge, the famous One Mile Telescope, one of the most important scientific instruments in the world, uses 60-foot dishes to synthesize an aerial one mile in diameter. That is to say, it maps the sky exactly as if it were a steerable dish one mile across. This telescope has three dishes. Two are fixed exactly half a mile apart. The third moves on rails for a further half mile. Having three dishes, shortens the length of any particular series of observations. With a single large aerial, all the signals hitting its surface take the same time to travel to the recorder. The signals from the surface of each of the three dishes travel along separate cables, but they all must take exactly the same time to reach the recorder. An error of only a millimeter in the cable length can significantly affect the accuracy of the observation. The aerials on their rails here move across the diameter of the equivalent large telescope. We need to synthesize the whole area of it, and for this, we need a second dimension. The Earth's rotation provides this. This rotating map of the world has been produced by computer. The cross tracks the latitude of the one-mile telescope at Cambridge from east to west. In fact, if these are two dishes, then as the globe turns, they move around each other. When the globe pivots on one dish, the other appears to sweep a circular ring around it. The width of the ring is the diameter of the dish, so eventually the whole area of the circle is filled in by progressively changing the separation of the dishes. Let's look at this effect again. We can see how the two dishes, on an east to west line, appear to reverse their relative positions when they have described a semicircle around the Earth's axis. Each observation, with the dishes at a known distance apart, takes a day and completes a part of the total area. The separation is then changed and the next observation starts 24 hours from the previous one, and so on until the whole aerial has been covered, that is, synthesized.
For many of the sources radio astronomers want to look at, the incoming signals remain constant for periods long enough to cover this process of aerial synthesis. The signals received and stored during a series of observations over many days contain as much information as could have been obtained by scanning a one-mile dish across the same area of the sky. The whole observation process is controlled by a program produced beforehand in the computer and punched on a control tape. Once this is set running, the astronomers can leave the whole telescope to work automatically while the information received from space is punched out in a form the computer can handle. When the observations are complete, they are analysed by the computer. The results may then be printed as a list of numbers or drawn as a series of profiles. The one mile telescope with a resolution of six seconds of arc at a wavelength of six centimetres reveals the detailed structure of many individual sources. The map of radio brightness is drawn at each stage as a series of profiles across the region of the sky we are observing. We start with observations taken with the aerials close together and we have only a blurred picture of the radio source. For this illustration, the computer was used to build up a map of a complex radio source, one of the strongest in the sky. As the computer adds successive observations with the aerials further apart, we can see finer details in the structure of the source. We finally have a map showing all the details that we could observe with a single telescope a mile in diameter, if we could have built one. This map, in fact, is of an exploded star, a supernova in the constellation of Cassiopeia. The remnant of this explosion, which occurred 300 years ago, is a spherical shell of hot gas emitting strong radio waves. The same stored information has been used to prepare this map, in which the contours are drawn around the areas of equal signal strength. It is from studies of such high resolution maps that scientists hope to understand the physical processes involved. This is another such map of the radio galaxy Cygnus A. It shows that powerful radio waves come from two compact regions, each about 200,000 light years either side of the parent galaxy visible in optical telescopes. The energy associated with this source is equivalent to the total destruction of one million stars, a situation of unimaginable and still unexplained violence. The last type of map is used in cosmology, the study of how the universe as a whole has evolved. What we should really like to do is to compare a picture of the sky now with one taken, say, a thousand million years ago. This, of course, we cannot do, but we can do something which is nearly as good. Because if we take the light or radio waves from a very distant galaxy, they have taken so long in reaching us that they are telling us about how that galaxy was a long time ago in the past. So that if we compare observations of nearby and distant galaxies, we can build up a picture of how the universe has changed. The one mile telescope has been used in this way to explore back in time to when the universe was only about one-tenth of its present age, at a time when the galaxies were being born. These observations seem to show without doubt that we are living in a universe in which the density of matter is continually decreasing. The information gathered by the one mile telescope has raised a host of problems for scientists, problems that may well require for their solution new developments in physical theory. With its high sensitivity and resolution, it has detected signals over a hundred times weaker than had previously been picked up. This is one of several such maps produced. The small circles indicate the furthest objects ever detected by man. To explore them more deeply requires a still larger telescope. Seen here nearing completion on the same site is a new instrument built by the Science Research Council at a cost of over two million pounds. It consists of four fixed and four movable aerials, each 12.8 metres in diameter, arranged along an east-to-west line. The dishes of this new telescope 
will synthesize the area of a single, fully steerable aerial five kilometers in diameter. A structure that clearly would be impossible to build today. The new instrument will help radio astronomers to learn more about the very remote radio sources only just detectable by the One Mile Telescope. What the One Mile Telescope has shown us in the supernova remnants, in the radio galaxies, and in the quasars, are many strange processes, some of which are difficult to explain on existing physical theory. Nature is providing us with laboratories in which we can study events far more powerful than those we can reproduce on Earth. With the greatly increased resolution of the five kilometer telescope, we hope we may be able to make good use of these celestial laboratories in our investigation of some of those fundamental problems in physics.